Hello and welcome to the CBT Nuggets Quality of Service course. My name is Jeremy Chara and I'm really excited to be with you as we take a look at Cisco QoS. I'm excited because maybe like you, I started off into the quality of service world thinking, well, this is just a way that we can make our voice and video traffic prioritized over all the rest. Great. And, and there's no doubt that's absolutely correct. Quality of service does make sure that our voice and video traffic gets across the network as fast as it possibly can. But by the time this course is done, and even by the time this introductory nugget is done, I think you'll agree that there's so much more that QoS is capable of. As a matter of fact, within a few years, I can almost guarantee that it will be difficult to find a network that does not have some form of quality of service. And even in the upcoming decade, as more and more homes move to voice over IP, we're going to see QoS in the home market. So I'd like to start off this nugget by taking a look at where did quality of service come from? How has it evolved over the last, say, eight years? Then we'll look at understanding quality of service requirements for your network data, voice, and video traffic each has their own requirements and we'll look at them. We'll then look at the methods for deploying quality of service on Cisco equipment. There's four major ways that you can set up quality of service. Some are easier, a lot easier than others, and we'll look a look at, take a look at each one and where it fits. Finally, we'll look at a quality of service tool belt. That's right, you do have a QoS tool belt around your waist that is equipped with tools to address quality on each area of your network in a little different way. So we'll look at all the tools and where you might use each one of them and then that's going to be the rest of the course is looking at each one of those tools extensively what it is and how to implement it on your network. Well let's start things off by taking a step into our time machine and traveling back to 1992. A day and age when dinosaurs ruled the network world and roamed our networks. And all TCP IP traffic was treated equally with a best effort system. Essentially, the first person who got to the network and tried to send their data got the bandwidth. And as more people came, they fought for the bandwidth and it was a survival of the fittest. And that system worked and still works to this day for most applications because applications have built-in mechanisms that allow them to recover or slow down if bandwidth is at a premium. That is how data networks worked until newer applications came out that required priority traffic and priority bandwidth and the need to get from point A to point B very quickly. That was when the first QoS method was released known as integrated services. A lot of people know this as RSVP because that was the only mechanism that came out with integrated services. Just like the name implies, RSVP reserves bandwidth for applications. So you would essentially have an application at point A that needed to communicate with an, a, a device over at point Z. And you might go through five routers in between. RSVP meant that you reserved bandwidth at every router and you're guaranteed that no matter what that bandwidth is yours. Well integrated services worked great until a lot of applications that needed bandwidth came out and before long all the bandwidth was reserved and we were back at point A. Best effort because no one was able to get any bandwidth that was left over. That's when something known as differentiated services came out. DiffServe or differentiated services is one of the more popular QoS methods that's still in use today and we do use integrated and differentiated services styles of quality of service together. DiffServe or differentiated services gives a per hop mechanism for prioritizing traffic. And I put per hops, we'll put per hop. <laughs> per hop, which means every router that you get to will requeue you and reprioritize you based on different markings. And we'll get deeper into how differentiated services work. But this allowed more flexibility. As in, you didn't have reservations of bandwidth that locked out all all traffic's ability to send like inserve. Instead, you had the ability to prioritize it each point and when the priority traffic reached a certain limit you could go ahead and cut it off and keep it from overwhelming the network. We'll take a look as I mentioned at the different forms of differentiated services. Once we reached around the year 2000 
and I jumped over that in my graph, that was where we came out with MPLS and VPN quality of service. MPLS, multi-protocol label switching, is a method that allows us to essentially route at layer two. And when I say us, I mean service providers. Service providers primarily use MPLS to get their customers traffic through the network very quickly. We were able to implement quality of service in those MPLS networks and within VPNs that allowed people to connect from a home network with an IP phone or some sort of high priority traffic and be prioritized all the way through the network. Round 2002-2003 was when Cisco came out with something called Auto QoS. I prefer to call it Template QoS, which is essentially an automated system to deploy quality of service on switches and routers. Now, I saved Auto QoS towards the end of the series because I find if I show people this Auto QoS feature early on, they tend to drift away and think, oh, well, I don't need all of this other QoS because I have this magic button I can push and poof, QoS is deployed everywhere. Well, while that is somewhat true with auto QoS, there's still a lot of tweaking and tuning that you may have to do for your specific network environment. That's what all the nuggets up to auto QoS is going to teach us how to do. Then we'll take a look at how to deploy a template and tweak it from there. Finally, in modern times, 2004-2005, we're seeing now QoS used for security. And who knows where the end of this will be. We're seeing quality of service mechanisms like NBAR, Network Based Application Recognition, that can recognize applications, not just port numbers, and limit, prioritize, or whatever we want to do with those applications. For example, you remember the SQL Slammer Worm that came out a few years back? Well, the Slammer Worm had specific characteristics about it that if we had NBAR and a lot of the mechanisms that we use nowadays deployed, we would have been able to recognize the signature of SQL Slammer Worm uh, packets and restrict them from entering the network. That's just one form of using quality of service for security. I expect this to increase as more and more quality of service mechanisms are developed. But this is about where we're at nowadays. We have the ability to do nearly everything with quality of service. Before we get too deep into the understanding of quality of service tools and methods, I'd like to take a step back and just look at a network any network because they're all different and as you take a look at all the different types of traffic you have to boil it down and figure out what quality of service is going to look like for that network that's why quality of service is so fun to me is no two networks are the same so no design will ever be the same it always takes you looking at the network and figuring out what it's going to look like for this customer this client this network design so let's take a look at the three different major class categories of traffic and understand what quality of service looks like for each one and I'd like to start with voice and video because those are the most predictable, I guess you could say, out of all the network traffic. Voice traffic, if I were to assign characteristics, I would definitely say voice is very smooth. It requires a constant stream of traffic that's going to be traveling through the network. And at the same time, it's very benign. And what I mean by that is once it starts consuming traffic, it never, never really asks for more. And when I say traffic, I mean bandwidth. Once it starts consuming bandwidth, it doesn't really ask for more. It's a smooth, benign sort of stream that goes across the network. The reason that's great is voice traffic is very predictable. Let's say, and I'll get into all these a little bit later, but let's say that you are using the G.711 audio codec across your network. What that means is essentially you're not compressing audio at all. You're getting the highest quality audio that most networks will support. And you're just adding some IP uh, header information to the front of the packet. In most networks, G711, without any special modifications, eats up about 80 kilobits per second per call. So when somebody lifts up a handset and calls somebody else, I know, hey, 80 kilobits per second will be used in my network. And if I have two calls, I know it's going to go up to 160 kilobits per second. I'm not going to have a sudden flood of voice traffic or a sudden burst of voice traffic because call patterns are generally pretty traditional on most networks and you can create models and understand how voice traffic is going to be. 
The thing that I do know about voice traffic as well is that it is very sensitive to drops anytime I lose a packet and delay. So if I have any delay or dropping of packets on the network, my voice quality will suffer and it will begin to sound like a bad cell phone call. Video is the same in a sense, in the sense that it can be very predictable. However, it's very bursty in the sense that when I open a video stream, I'm going to have a lot of bandwidth suddenly consumed on the network. If I have many people tuning into a video broadcast or uh, video streams, it's suddenly going to burst on my network and consume quite a bit of, of bandwidth. In that sense, instead of being benign, I would say that video traffic is very greedy in the sense that it will take as much bandwidth as you can give it. The disadvantage of video is it's also drop and delay sensitive. If you drop video or delay video packets, the video will begin to break up and you'll start seeing you know, the, the video scramble. I'm sure many of you have seen a video stream across the internet when you start losing some packets and little sections of the videos begin to scramble. The saving grace with video is that it is not as important as voice. One of the hot new features of networks is video conferencing in the sense that I can have a voice call and see somebody's video at the same time. It's one of the new features of Call Manager 4.0. The nice thing is, is when it comes to priority, voice gets the higher priority and video gets the lower. Now, not the lowest, but the lower. Because if I drop voice packets, people instantly notice and it makes the call incomprehensible, as in I don't understand it anymore. If I lose video packets, the video may scramble, but I can still hear exactly what the person is saying, which is, as I'm sure you realize right now, not much of a problem. <laughs> Data traffic, on the other hand, is the very differing one. This is why I say every network is different. You might have data traffic that might be smooth, maybe Citrix traffic. Citrix is a huge application that enterprises use to remotely access applications, and it's a great application. However, Citrix traffic needs to have a very smooth uninterrupted screen, a stream or else the, the application becomes virtually unusable. The mouse will jump around, cells of your Excel spreadsheet that you're accessing will begin to not respond the way you want them to respond. So Citrix is very sensitive to that. Very smooth, very benign in how much that it consumes. Now FTP, on the other hand, to throw another data application out on the table, is very bursty, very greedy of traffic, and it will consume as much as, it, as you can throw at it. Citrix, very sensitive to drops. FTP, very insensitive. And that's the whole idea of data traffic is each application has differing characteristics that you'll have to understand for those. The key of all the quality of service requirements on your network is that you do understand what is being used on the network and its characteristics. That's the key to deploying quality of service. In every epic tale, there's a hero and there's a villain. And this one is no different. Our hero, quality of service. The four evil villains would be lack of bandwidth, packet loss, delay, and jitter. Quality of service is there to combat each one of these except one, and that is lack of bandwidth. That's one of the things I want to make very clear from the beginning of this course. If you have a severe lack of bandwidth, quality of service won't help you. One of the famous quotes that I've heard is, just adding bandwidth to the problem doesn't help. My answer is, well, sure it will. If you add enough bandwidth to anything, it will fix the problem. The trouble is that bandwidth costs money, so that we have to work with less bandwidth than most of the time we would like to have. However, having a severe lack of bandwidth will not be helpful. A quality of service cannot help that situation. Your network is essentially a sinking ship, and quality of service is just rearranging the deck chairs as it goes down. So overall, lack of bandwidth is something that you'll have to definitely take up with management. If you're analyzing your network and thinking there is no way that quality of service can even touch this with all the voice and data traffic that I have going across this WAN link, then you need to upgrade that WAN link before you can go on. Quality of service is meant to combat temporary congestion, congestion that it does not happen all the time. And that's where it can help fight packet loss, delay, and jitter. Packet <laughs>